I, uh, on Thursday, I was just kind of goofing around and I was doing a little bit of research on something unrelated to this, but I ran across a story that I decided to include, and it's a story of a young man by the name of Joshua Bell. Joshua Bell's in his mid-30s and he's a great violinist. In fact, he's like one of the, the best ever, okay? This is a picture of him right up here. And he has, um, you know, played at Carnegie Hall when he was 17. He was the soloist there. People pay hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars to uh, come and listen to him. Uh, Daryl One, who's a member of our church, he is a world-class um, conductor. He literally travels the world conducting uh, orchestras, and he actually had the opportunity to conduct uh, Stephen or, or Joshua Bell in, a, uh, in Indiana once. That, um, that uh, violin he's got there is, uh, was built in 1800 by uh, Antonio Stradivarius himself. That has never been refinished, that violin that he plays, and he paid north of four million dollars for that uh, violin. So anyway, I was reading the story about him and he had done a concert in uh, Boston. And once again, you know, hundreds of you know, dollars are spent on these tickets to, to see this, this, pro, you know, this guy play, just unbelievable guy. He decides to do an experiment. So he puts on some crummy old jeans and a crummy old shirt and he puts on a ball cap. He goes to Washington, D.C. and he goes down into the subway system. He goes down there with a four million dollar violin. He opens up the little case, pulls it out, and this master, few people can play the violin like, like this young guy can. People who pay hundreds and hundreds of dollars to see him play will drive thousands of miles to hear him play. He's down on the subways, the dirty, rotten subways, and he's playing. And everybody's just walking by him. You can YouTube it. You can actually see it. Nobody's stopping. Nobody's really looking at it. Nobody really cares. They're just kind of walking by. Some people, you know, throw a nickel into his case, and they just kind of they just kind of keep going. There, there was one uh, young boy who, you know, his mom had him by the hand, and he stops right in front of him, and he's just captivated by him. And mom's trying to pull the young boy and. The boy just can't take his eyes off of the guy. By the time it was all done, uh, he had made $37.12. <laughs> and 20 of that $37 came from one guy who recognized him. And he threw a 20 in the thing. They asked him, they, asked, they said, Joshua, what was the most awkward thing about, you know, playing down there in this crummy subway with people just walking by? And he said, well, by far, the most awkward thing is, is I would get done. No applause. <laughs> Nothing. Or he's used to, you know, the whole place erupting, you know, <laughs> thousands of people. And so he said, I just kind of started the next song, you know. And I read that story on Thursday, literally it was Thursday, I read it, and I went, you know what? That's what happens at Christmas, I think. We have this incredible moment where, where Jesus comes to planet Earth and we're all just so busy. We've got our trees and our wreaths and our Hallmark cards and the baking and the partying and just, just all the stuff, buying presents. And, and I do all that too. There's nothing inherently evil in all that stuff. But I think sometimes we can get so busy that we're, we just rock right by the master. We don't even, we don't even recognize the, the master in the room. We don't even recognize the nativity scene that you put up two weeks ago and now it's just there and you just pass it by and you don't even realize the significance and the weightiness of what all those little figurines really, really mean. So I thought I'd take just a, a, a moment maybe and just share with you really the, the two miracles of this season. 
what we're celebrating right now, this time of year, the reason why we put up all the trees and wreaths and cards and flowers and all, all the stuff we do really is because of two miracles that happened this time of year. We celebrate these two miracles. And the first one I think we all get, and that is the miracle of who came to planet Earth. That is that God came to planet Earth. I think most people get that. Even those of you in this room who aren't necessarily religious, you, you don't even necessarily believe in God, you don't believe that this is you know, God's word, you understand there, there's enough carols out there, there's enough movies out there, Christmas cards that come, that you understand that really the first miracle that we celebrate is the fact that God came to planet Earth. Luke chapter two says, today in the town of David, the town of Bethlehem, a savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. God came to planet earth. The great apostle Paul said, though he was God, though Jesus was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and he was born as a human being. That's what this first miracle that we celebrate is all about, about that God came to, to, to planet Earth. Christmas is really a celebration of an invasion, the, the invasion of God to planet Earth. How many of you, and I, and I think the number is going to be higher than normal because of what has happened here just recently, but how many of you remember what happened on July 21st, 1969? Just, just raise your hand. You, you know. Yeah. And I'll guarantee you, you wouldn't have known or wouldn't have remembered unless, you know, what has happened here recently happened. Let me give you a hint for those of you that don't know. It happened at a place called the Sea of Tranquility. Ah, yeah, some of you are getting it. How about this? The eagle has landed. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. On July 21st, 1969, Neil Armstrong got into a rocket ship, took off from planet Earth, flew all the way to the moon. He opened the lunar lander and he got out and he walked on the moon. I remember being a kid back then, I was seven or eight. I remember going outside and trying to look at the moon, thinking I could see, you know, the, 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 the lunar lander. I, I, I was hoping I could see a, a man walking on the moon was an unbelievable moment in human history. But as crazy of a moment that was, it pales in comparison to the day that Jesus, if you will, got on a rocket ship and left the glories of heaven and landed here. I mean, Neil Armstrong going to the moon was off the, off the hook. <laughs> but it doesn't compare to God leaving heaven and coming here Amen. and being born as a human being. That, that, that's the first miracle. I, th I think we all kind of get that. But, but here, here's the weightier one. It, it, it's, the, it's the one that I think a lot of people miss. It's, it's really the, the second miracle that we celebrate this time of year, and that is this, the miracle of why God came. Well, what, what's the point of this baby in a manger 2,000 years ago? What, what was that all about? The, the why, and the why is that God came for, for our benefit. It's a much more weightier miracle. The why that he came for our benefit. Paul said this, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. 
Christ Jesus came into the world 2,000 years ago in a little town called Bethlehem. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Hey, put that verse back up again, will you? And then he writes this, and I hadn't been born yet when Paul wrote that, of whom I am the worst. <laughs> Either a Jew. See, in one little sentence, the great apostle says, hey, hey, here's, here's why there's a manger. Here, here's the why. That Jesus came to save sinners. Beloved, sin is at the very heart of Christmas. And the real beauty of Christmas is to have a good understanding of this. If you don't get this, then all you got are trees and wreaths and lights and cards and cookies and presents. If you don't understand that sin is at the very heart of Christmas, you miss the real beauty of it all. The reason why I put my tree up and put a wreath up and put lights up and the reason why I like to party this time of year, the reason why we, I do what I do is because I, I've got a good understanding of this truth. It's what makes Christmas such a beautiful time of the year for me, for the people of this church. John the Baptist said this about Jesus. It says the next day, John, that's John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, look. And he points at Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John, John knew the purpose of that baby. He, he, he knew why Jesus had come. He got it. Sin, beloved, is at the very heart of Christmas. But here's the deal. I, I know that some of you are out there and you, you don't really understand this thing called sin. You know, what exactly is it? What's the big deal? You know, why, why did God have to come and deal with it? One day, uh, there was a man by the name of Pilate, and he asked Jesus a question, and Jesus gave him a really profound answer. It says this in John 18. He, Pilate said, uh, you, are, you are a king then, right, Jesus? And Jesus answered, you're right in saying that I'm a king. In fact, for this reason, I was born, and for this, I came into the world to testify to the truth. I want you to look at that last word up there, to the truth. We're living in a time in an age when there's just so many weird philosophies out there. Doesn't, doesn't seem like a week goes by and I turn on my TV and there's just some weirdo on there teaching some weird philosophy or some weird truth. They're all over the internet. These crazy philosophies. Crazy thoughts about life. One of the things that Jesus said is I came because I wanted you to know truth. I wanted you to know the truth. So let me just quickly give you four critical truths. These are four truths that I know Jesus wants you to know, and the first one is this, and if you don't get this one, then it doesn't make any sense. The whole story of God doesn't make, the whole story of the baby coming doesn't make sense, and that is this, you were made in God's image. The Bible tells us in Genesis 1 and 2 that God created everything. In fact, those five words right there, the first five words of the Bible, if you don't get those first five words, if those first five words don't make any sense to you, then the rest of the story doesn't make any sense. That in the beginning, God created. And the first couple of chapters of, of Genesis tell us about a God who created uh, these poinsettias, and, and then he created Gerber daisies, and then he created, uh, you know, uh, uh, great trees, and oak trees and worms and snails and trout and fish, porcupines. He creates everything. And then the Bible says he creates human beings. But human beings are different. It says that human beings were created in his image. 
You see, this poinsettia was created by God, but it is not made in his image. A trout was created by God, but a trout is not created in his image. You are. That's what makes human life so different than any other life. Anybody here ever get upset if you step on a cockroach? Anybody get all bowed out of shape if you, you know, hit a fly in your house with a fly swatter? Uh -uh. But take a human life. <laughs> You'll spend the rest of your life in jail maybe, or worse. Because human life is different than any other life. It's, it's sacred. We call it the, the sanctity of human life. It's separate. It's, it's different. It's unique. It's not like any other life form on planet Earth. Yes, God created everything, but we were actually created in his image. That's how special God thinks of us. And I realize that there are forces out there that want you to believe that you're not anything really special, that you're simply a happenstance of two molecules getting together maybe a billion years ago. That you're just simply educated goo. That you're a little higher up the evolutionary chain than a baboon. But you're not. The Bible says that no, 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 no. I created you in my image. You're special to me. You matter to me. And one of the things that God wanted was for us as human beings is just simply love him back. But to do that, for us to love God back freely, God had to do something kind of unique. And he gave us all a free will. He gave the first man a free will. Said, Adam, it's all yours. As far as the eye can see, enjoy it all. It's there for your enjoyment. I'm going to take care of you. You're going to worship me. But here, here's the deal. Just one tree right over there. Just stay away from that one. Don't eat from that one. Now, all of a sudden, God had set up something where he was going to find out whether human beings really wanted to love him because they made the choice to love him. Not because we were just simply robots. I love you, God. I love you. I love you, God. I love No. God wanted us to love him because we made the choice to love him. But the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 3 that Adam made a, a, a really crummy choice. He used his free will in a really crummy way, and he chooses to blow God off, and he goes and eats the fruit that he's not supposed to eat. And at that moment, bam, everything changed. Sin was now going to be a part of the equation of life. When the Bible says that when Adam sinned, sin entered the, 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 the world. Got this, we got this huge problem, which is the second truth, that when Adam disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden and brought sin into the hearts of every human being, all of us have experienced it. And I, I, I can prove the fact that all of us are just sinful. We're, we're disobedient at our core. Moms, dads, uh, grandmas, grandpas, has, was there ever a moment when you sat your child down and you said, okay, I love you, you're my children, and I want to teach you how to disobey. <laughs> just came natural, didn't it? Didn't have to teach them how to disobey. What we have to tell our children is we sit them down and try to help them to obey because being disobedient just comes natural to us as human beings. Take two three-year-olds, put them in a room together with one ball and you'll see the selfishness, right? You don't have to teach your kids to be selfish. It just comes natural. See, when Adam sinned in the garden. A part of our DNA, if you will, was going to be we were all going to have a sinful nature and they passed that sinful nature down to their children who passed it down to their children who passed it down to their children 
who pass it down to their children, who pass it down to your grandpa, who pass it down to your father, who pass it down to you. And if you have children, you pass the sinful nature on to them. All of us have sinned. We've all disobeyed God. The great prophet Isaiah said, all of us like sheep have strayed away. We've left God's past to follow our own. In other words, we all became like Adam. God says, hey, here, here, here's my will for your life. And all of us have gone, you know what? No, thanks. I'll just do things my way. I don't want anybody telling me what to do. I'm the CEO of my own life. All of us have done that. It's impacted all of our lives. Proverbs says, who can say I've kept my heart pure and I'm clean and without sin? And the answer is nobody. Nobody can. We've all thought things that were crummy. We all said things that are crummy. We've all done things that are crummy. Here's another way I can prove the, the point. One of the great gifts that God has given all of us in this room is a conscience. I always say it's a pesky little thing. You see, when you think something bad, ding, guilt. Or you do something bad, bing, guilt. God gave it to you just to be a reminder to you, you're sinful. Just reminds you of this truth. When you think something, you know it. You know it's bad, it's wrong. In fact, you know what your conscience does? Listen to me. Your conscience keeps you from being as evil as you could be. You see, because you have a conscience, it keeps you from doing things you shouldn't do. And what's really scary is when you run across a person who doesn't have a conscience. We have a name for them, sociopaths. They don't have a conscience. They don't care what they do. Because we have one, it keeps us from allowing sin to just run amok in our lives. The third truth is that sin broke the relationship between you and God. The great prophet said, it's your sins that have cut you off from God. Hey, husbands and wives, when you guys get in a little fight, little argument, doesn't it kind of goof up your relationship a little bit? When your children don't obey you, doesn't it goof up your relationship? The Bible says because we've sinned against God, it goofed up our relationship. In fact, for some of you, it goofed up your relationship so much you don't even believe in him anymore, do you? There was a long time in my life I didn't believe in him. That's how, that's how powerful sin is. It can get you to a place where you don't even believe that there's a God who created you cares about you and loves you deeply. Think about this. You know, God's this perfect, holy, righteous, you know, being, and he's in heaven, and heaven's this perfect place. If he allowed us to go to heaven with all of our sin, how long do you think it would take before heaven was just like earth? Messed up. 20 seconds? 30 Who'd want to go there if everybody who was there still had their sin and all the evil and junk and crud was going on there that goes on here? We'd have to have the military up there too because people just will goof around, man, in incredible ways. So here's the deal. God had to do something about our sin Something had to be done. And so in Genesis chapter three, after the first human being sins and brings sin into the world, God says, okay, here's the deal. I love you. You're made in my image. And so I'm gonna send a savior. I'm gonna send a Messiah. 
I'm going to send the gospel. And so all Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all those great uh, prophetic books, you get to Malachi, every single one of the 39 books in the Old Testament all talk about the Savior who was going to come, the Messiah who would come, the one who could take away our sin, the sin that had separated us from God. Which brings me to the last truth. Because God loves you, he created you, he promised to send you a savior that had the power to fix the problem of sin. Really, the, 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 the story between these two leather-bound covers is really a love story. It's a story about a God who creates us and we rebel against him, but he so loves us. I'm gonna send a savior. I'm gonna send you a Messiah. I'm gonna send you the gospel. I'm gonna send you the good news. And the Bible says in Romans chapter three, for God presented Jesus Christ as the sacrifice for sins. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. You see, here's the deal. It wasn't enough that the Savior would just come. God promised the Savior and he delivered on the promise. But it wasn't enough that he just came. Him coming didn't fix our, our problem. The Bible says he lived for a little over 33 years. He lived a perfect life, a sinless life, a righteous life, a holy life, a pure life. And when he was a little over 33 years old, he voluntarily went to a cross. He allowed some Roman soldiers to put him on a cross. He shed his blood for us. They took him off of that cross and they put him into a tomb. Three days later, he walked out of that tomb, which makes sense because he was God. We call that, we celebrate that day, that's called Easter. And he offers life to anybody who would put their trust in him. He says, hey, listen, heaven's a perfect place. I can't let you in here, but here's what we'll do. I'll come and I'll live the perfect life for you. And if you'd surrender your life over to me, Jesus says, you know what? I'll come into your life. And you can get into heaven, not on your goodness, but you'll get into heaven on my goodness. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born for you and there's only one problem with the savior and that's this. Savior doesn't do you any good if you don't recognize your need for one. And so far Thursday night, Friday night, last hour, there've been quite a few people that have come in here thinking they were coming to a musical and God opened their eyes to an incredible truth. And it wasn't the music, it wasn't me, it was simply an act of the Holy Spirit moving in people's life. And they came in and went, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I think I get this. I remember that moment in my life where it was like, I get it. And it's simply an act of God. He does it. And I think he's opened up some of your eyes. And so this is what I want you to just close. Just everybody just kind of bow their heads for a moment. Just bow, I, I, I want to get you alone. I don't want you to pray or anything like that. I just don't worry about who's sitting next to you. Don't worry about your spouse or your kids or your girlfriend or whoever. I just want to get you alone. A thousand people in this room. I just want to get you alone. And here's the deal. Maybe there's one of you here. And right now you're saying, I need the Savior. I get this. I get it. My sin has separated me from God, and I want Jesus in my life. I want the Savior in my life. This is all I'm going to ask you to do right where you're at. Just, I want you to pray this prayer and just mean it in your heart, okay? And it, you don't find this prayer in a Bible anywhere. Just you mean it, and God will know it. Just say, Jesus, I get it. My sin separated me from you. I couldn't fix the problem of my sin. 
but you did because you loved me. And right now I give my life to you, Jesus. I surrender my life to you. I, I want you, Jesus, to be the CEO of my life. My life's yours now. Now here's the deal, while your heads are bowed and eyes are closed, do, do me a favor, and it's kind of hard for me to see, but if you prayed that, if you ignited a, a faith within you and you prayed that, would you, would you raise your hand that I could hip hip hooray you and rejoice with you? Yeah, a few of you right over here, some of you up in the balcony. How about over here in the middle section, anybody? Yeah, yeah. Anybody over here? A couple of little, yeah, I see you back there, man. That's cool. How about over here? A couple of little gals down here, great. Anybody else? Yeah, I see you, man. I got you up there. All right, everybody just look up here real quick. In just a moment, we're gonna surprise all the moms and dads who dropped your kids off here. They're all gonna be choir members here in just a moment. But this is what I want you to do. You got that card, okay? You got the card. Got all your data on there. And you're gonna to walk to these little out, outside every door. We got a little box, a little receptacle. You can drop these cards in that box. But if you prayed, and there were quite a few hands that went up, if you prayed, do me a favor, and just put a little box up in the corner, and that card will be given to me tonight before I leave. And I can go home and pray for you, rejoice in the decision or whatever's going on in your life. Just put a box up there. Because what I wanna do is invite you to a, a class that I teach, it's called uh, the Follow Class. It starts in January. It's uh, actually in your program. And, Love to have you be a part of it. I want to give you a personal invite. I promise I'm not going to show up at your door on Monday. Hey! You know, oh no, the preacher's here. And it's dinner time. I won't do that. But I do want to invite you. So make sure I, I got your email address or your snail mail address. And either way, I'll, I'll get you something just to invite you to it. And I'd love to have you come. It's eight weeks long. And we basically just kind of take you through eight basic thoughts of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And if the decision that you made was real tonight, look, you'll do all that you can to be down here on Wednesday night. We got childcare. It's really a, a, a really casual setting. Love to have you be a part of it. You might be out there and you're going, you know what? I don't know if this Jesus thing is real, but I sure would like to learn more about what Christianity is all you know, about. And you, you, you could put a little star up in the corner and I'll invite you to it. Maybe you gave your life to Christ last weekend or last month or whenever it was, and you're thinking, hey, can I come to the class? You put a star up there, and I'll make sure I send you the, all the information. We'll get you signed up. So I'd love to be, you know, I'd love to have you in that class too. It gets full pretty quick, so, so you might want to just take that little flyer home and get on our website and be a part of it. Get a part of it. Get signed up. But certainly those of you that put a square on there, Make, make sure in just a moment you, you put those in those little, little things up at the door. Father, thanks, Lord, for this story, this historically accurate, factual story of how we got here. You created us. You love us. And we sinned. But you still loved us. And you sent the Savior. I'm thankful for those that seem to be, you're doing something in their life. I hope that they'll give us some time in the new year to help tease out whatever it is that you're doing in their lives, God. And may this last song here be a great way just to kind of end our time. And I pray this in your name. Amen.